New details and reaction this Friday night to the assassination of Hamas's leader. The cautious optimism his death could bring peace. I think that the world has to seize this opportunity. What Israel and Hamas are saying about how the war could end. Dissension in the ranks. A longtime Liberal Party advisor amplifying calls for Justin Trudeau's resignation. A proposed big payout from Big Tobacco. The potential landmark legal settlement for smokers and their families. Plus, hoop dreams coming true. It's become mainstream. What's fueling the WNBA's soaring popularity? Global National. Reporting tonight, Jeff Semple. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We're learning new details about the death of Yahya Sinwar. The longtime leader of Hamas was killed on Wednesday after Israeli forces fired a tank shell at a building in southern Gaza. His death sparked speculation about a possible end to the war in Gaza. But tonight, those hopes are fading fast. In his first comments since Sinwar's killing, the deputy leader of Hamas says it only fuels the group's motivation. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu insists the war is not over. Over. Redmond Shannon reports from London on a possible crossroads in the conflict. A tank firing at a damaged building in southern Gaza, the moment Israel says it killed Yahya Sinwar. Just minutes before, he threw a plank of wood at a drone on the second floor of the building. Analysis by Global News estimates it happened just before 5 p.m. on Wednesday, in a location just over 1,400 metres from the border with Egypt. It wasn't until Thursday when Israeli troops found the body that they realised the man inside was Sinwar. Many Israelis wonder if this could be a turning point. I hope it's going to bring peace as soon as possible. Cautious optimism shared by Western leaders. Now we must make the most of this moment. Tempered by a reality check from Israel's biggest ally. There's a possibility of working for a ceasefire in Lebanon. And it's going to be harder in Gaza, but we agree that there has to be an outcome. The red lines of Israel and Hamas still mismatch. While this is not the end of the war in Gaza, it's the beginning of the end. It can end if Hamas lays down its arms and returns our hostages. Hamas's deputy leader says hostages will not be returned until Israel leaves Gaza and Hamas prisoners are freed. He said Sinwar's death only increases its motivation. I think it's even more complicated now because of just the disarray that's that's hit the leadership. This former Canadian diplomat in the Middle East says it's not yet known how well Hamas could even coordinate the movement of hostages. The ability of Hamas to negotiate has been degraded, but also that there may be desires for retribution and the most obvious way out that is through the hostages and killing them. And Redmond, is there any word tonight on who might replace Sinwar as leader and whether that choice might offer any clues about the future direction of Hamas? Well, Jeff, perhaps the most obvious is the deputy leader we saw there, Khalil al Haya. He has been a key part of its negotiation team. Then there is Sinwar's younger brother, Mohammed, who is rarely seen in public, as well as Khalid Meshal, a former leader who is among a number of senior figures in Hamas, now living in Qatar. But it seems whoever takes over is unlikely to want to compromise on Hamas's demand of an Israeli withdrawal from Gaza. Jeff? Redmond Shannon in London. Thanks, Red. Hezbollah is vowing an escalated phase of fighting against Israeli troops in Lebanon. Rockets were fired towards Israel today. Israeli forces responded with a barrage of strikes on southern Lebanon, where fighting has been fierce. The United Nations peacekeeping mission, known as UNIFIL, is stationed in Lebanon to monitor hostilities, and it says it will remain despite being fired at by Israeli forces on several occasions. Israel has warned UN workers to leave for their own safety. The conflict in the Middle East has fueled a surge in attacks on Jewish communities here in Canada. And police in Toronto just arrested two people in connection with a shooting at a Jewish girls' school. 
Shots were fired at Beish Haya Mushka Elementary School early on Saturday for the second time in just six months. No one was injured. Police have now charged a 20-year-old, Helder Antonio de Almeida, and a 17-year-old who can't be named. Investigators say despite appearances, they have not yet determined if the school was targeted because it's Jewish. Liberal cabinet ministers are trying to show a united front despite the most organized effort to date to oust Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Top liberals insist the vast majority of caucus still supports the Prime Minister. But ahead of what's promised to be a tense meeting of the party next week, the list of those calling for Trudeau to go is growing and now includes a powerful former liberal advisor. Taria Isri reports. Three cabinet ministers fanned out across the country, trying to show business as usual. But it's not. The questions keep mounting about a possible mutiny. How serious is this threat to the prime minister's leadership? Some of your colleagues uh, plan to raise the issue of Justin Trudeau's leadership. Évidemment, on s'intéresse à ce qui se passe avec votre chef, Monsieur Trudeau. Justin Trudeau's inner circle is standing by him, despite a coordinated effort by up to 30 members of the Liberal caucus to push the Prime Minister out. How do you think he should respond? Well, first and foremost, uh, this is a con uh, question that you need to ask the Prime Minister himself, uh, because I'm convinced he's able to answer, and ultimately he can count on my loyalty. I am absolutely confident that the vast majority of members of our caucus support the Prime Minister. Backbenchers are also fielding questions too about Trudeau's future. Is it time for him to stay or is it time for him to go? Well that's a decision uh, the Prime Minister uh, will make. No copies or photos have leaked of the resignation document those Liberals have been asked to sign. Global News has reached out to more than 60 Liberal MPs about the document, but so far only one has gone public. Atlantic MP Sean Casey, who told media this week it's time for Trudeau to step aside. In another blow, former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien's chief of staff, Eddie Goldenberg, wrote an op-ed arguing Trudeau must go. Much as he has tried, a majority of Canadians have decided that they want a Prime Minister who is not Justin Trudeau. With a backbench revolt simmering and a cabinet shuffle also coming soon, after those four ministers announced they will not seek re-election, things could quickly get complicated when the Prime Minister meets with his caucus next week. It'll be their first face-to-face -face since the revolt began. The House is back Monday. Jeff? All right, Taria Isri in Ottawa. Thanks, Taria. British Columbia is reporting a record turnout at advanced polling stations ahead of tomorrow's provincial election. More than one million voters have already cast their ballot to decide if the governing NDP can hold on to power or if the B.C. Conservatives will triumph. Neithu Garcha reports on the final hours of a tight and tumultuous campaign. As B.C.'s south coast faces weather warnings which could influence who shows up at the polls on Saturday, the incumbent B.C. NDP leader is urging people to get out and vote. Your vote is going to matter in a way that it hasn't for a generation. David Eby is fighting hard to retain government facing a surprising challenge from B.C. Conservative leader John Rustad. That's why we are committed to seeing a children's hospital built right here in Surrey. And the B.C. Green Party might capture a few seats. We have one party led by a climate denier and another party led by a climate delayer. The latest polling data done exclusively for Global News indicates a tight race. The NDP leading with 44%, closely followed by the BC Conservatives at 42%, the BC Greens at 11%, and with a record 40 independents on the BC ballot, other parties capture 3%. The folks who have jobs and mortgages, bills to pay, potentially aging parents, uh, if they show up on election day, the Conservatives will have a really good chance of winning. Yeah, the, Why the would you pick a right. fight with Indigenous I, I, I people you, human as one of your first, first steps? Because, because, we got to work together the, Because here. John That's just wants to take us back to the 20th century. The intensity of the race was unexpected. The B.C. Liberals, who held power for 16 years until 2017, recently rebranded as B.C. United, distancing themselves from the federal party and Justin Trudeau, while federal conservative leader Pierre Polyev's message was resonating in B.C. His party's momentum pressured the B.C. NDP to make some surprise policy shifts 
like moving away from drug decriminalization. And the police had to go in and seize the drugs and arrest people. British Columbians need to know where you stand on these issues. Rustad used to be a BC Liberal, but was kicked out for his views on climate change. He's also supporting some controversial candidates, including South Surrey's Brent Chapman, Is Brent here? who refused to answer questions at his campaign office this week about social media posts from 2017, appearing to question the legitimacy of multiple high profile mass shootings. So Brent, why won't you talk to us about this comment? Whatever happens here could serve as a precursor for what we might see in the next federal election. Neetu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver. Manitoba is following Newfoundland and Labrador, becoming the second province to join the federal government's billion-dollar school food program. When you put in a carton of milk, a banana, a piece of bannock in the hands of a young person, it can boost the mood, help the engagement with other kids, help the engagement with educators. Over the next three years, Manitoba will receive more than 17 million federal dollars to help feed more than 19,000 students. That's on top of 30 million dollars the province has already budgeted for its own universal school nutrition program. First Nations chiefs have voted in favor of a new negotiation process to reform Canada's child welfare system, one day after rejecting a deal with the federal government. After emotional and at times heated debate, chiefs from across Canada voted last night to reject a $47.8 billion proposal to reform the First Nations Child and Family Services Program. Today, the Assembly of First Nations passed a resolution to create a new Children's Chiefs Commission with representatives from across the country to renegotiate with the federal government. There was a promise of $47.8 billion, but then when he got into the fine print, there was a lot of, well, what ifs, only if this happened, only if this happened. And it would leave First Nations children in a lot of uncertainty. There's some recalibration that needs to happen, uh, but we can get there. The proposed agreement followed a 17-year legal case and an order from the courts. The federal government says it remains steadfast in its commitment to reach an agreement on long-term reform. The U.S. is investigating Tesla's self-driving system following reports of four crashes, including one that killed a pedestrian. The road safety probe was launched over concerns the crashes happened during poor visibility, such as fog or sun glare. Investigators will look into the system's ability to detect and respond appropriately. Tesla says human drivers must be ready to intervene at all times. An estimated 2.4 million Teslas are equipped with the self-driving technology. An island-wide blackout coming up. Why millions of people in Cuba have been left in the dark. Plus, the proposed historic deal to settle lawsuits against tobacco giants. Cuba is in the dark tonight after a major power plant failure shut down the nation's entire electrical grid. Around 10 million people are now without electricity, despite the government's last-ditch efforts yesterday to conserve energy by shuttering many non-essential services. Work is now underway to restore power. The island nation is facing the worst energy crisis in its history, struggling with fuel shortages and aging infrastructure. Cuban officials also blame recent hurricanes and U.S. economic sanctions for disrupting fuel shipments. For decades, tobacco marketing failed to mention the highly addictive nature of the products, much less the potentially deadly consequences of smoking. Well now, following three decades of legal battles, a deal to compensate smokers suffering from terminal diseases is finally on the horizon. Catherine Ward explains. It feels uh, a little bit surreal, as if, uh, is this really happening? Is this a dream? After five years of negotiations, a $32.5 billion payout from three major tobacco companies is one step closer. Compensation for people who have been harmed. It was an extremely difficult process, which lasted uh, a, a really an ungodly amount of time, but we're very happy with the result. The arrangement includes nearly $25 billion for provincial and territorial governments, as well as more than $4 billion for the Quebec class action members. It also includes more than $2.5 billion for smokers in other provinces and territories who were diagnosed with smoking-related illnesses between March 2015 and March 2019. Manufacturers do have this obligation, and they can't simply ignore it because it's inconvenient or it might hurt their bottom line or they don't like the science. 
but the true obligation is to ensure that the consumer is fully informed of the risks that materialize with the use of a product. The entire proposal is hundreds of pages. At one point, it refers to the creation of the Foundation for Improved Outcomes in Tobacco-Related Diseases, a group that would focus on research. But analysts with the Canadian Cancer Society say the language doesn't go far enough. I think the question should be put to provincial ministers of health. Uh, How can you justify having a foundation that can only do research but cannot do initiatives to reduce smoking? Manitoba's premier says he's committed to finding a good outcome. Our team does view it as a sacred responsibility to work to ensure that more Manitobans can hear those four magic words. You are cancer free. Lawyers say there are a couple of final hurdles before the money is paid out. The plan must be submitted to a vote of creditors. That's expected to happen in December. Then there is a hearing before a judge who will have the final say. Jeff? Catherine Ward in Toronto. Thanks, Catherine. The number of cigarette smokers in Canada has been dropping for decades. In 2015, more than 5.3 million Canadians reported being daily or occasional smokers. Well, today that number has fallen by about a third, down to 3.8 million. And even fewer young Canadians, just 2% of high school students, reported smoking cigarettes. However, rates of vaping are rising. Nearly 17% of students in grades 7 to 12 reported using an e-cigarette or vaping product. Speaking out after years in captivity, still ahead, Canadian-American Paul Whelan discusses his detainment under the Russian regime. A Canadian-born man held in a Russian prison for nearly six years is speaking out for the first time since his release. Paul Whelan, a former U.S. Marine, was arrested and charged with espionage, an allegation that he is vehemently denied. Finally, in August, he was released in a prisoner swap. Bianca Faschini has his story. Months after his release from a Russian prison, Paul Whelan acknowledges the deep toll it took on his mental health. It did play with my mind. There was a, there was a psychological piece to this. The Canadian-born former Marine telling CBS News he now suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. It's common, you know, with with people Mm -hmm. that have been in this situation. It'll go away probably over a few years. But it's it's hard to, you know, compartmentalize and block out that that portion of what I went through. Whelan was arrested in December 2018 while in Moscow to attend a friend's wedding. Nearly two years later, He was convicted of espionage and sentenced to 16 years in prison. From day one, I was being told that um, there would be a trade, a political solution to the situation. But his path to freedom was uncertain at times. In 2022, a prisoner exchange led to the release of professional athlete Brittany Greiner and former Marine Trevor Reed, both of whom were detained in Russia after Whelan. It took nearly six years and negotiations between the U.S., Russia, and four other countries for his release to be secured. Ultimately, thanks to Germany, after German Chancellor Olaf Scholz agreed to free a convicted Federal Security Service assassin. Bianca Faschini, Global News, Washington. Up next, the popularity of the WNBA is soaring. So why are some players crying foul? King Charles and Queen Camilla touched down in Sydney to begin a six-day tour of Australia. It's his first visit to the country since becoming king as the country's head of state. The royals were welcomed by a stunning light show projected onto the Sydney Opera House. But their visit has also renewed debate over the monarchy's role in that country. None of Australia's six state premiers are set to attend Monday's official reception for the king. Closer to home, it could be another dramatic night on the hard court. The championship trophy is up for grabs in the WNBA Finals. New York and Minnesota are playing for the title. But as Eric Sorensen reports, with fans on both sides of the border flocking to the sport, the women's game is on a winning streak. It seems the WNBA has finally broken through. ESPN TV audiences up 170%. Attendance up 47%. It's truly remarkable that the leap this league has taken. And there are really few parallels like it in terms of suddenness in, in really all of sports. There we go. Bang. What changed? 
Caitlin Clark arrived, a college superstar who took the WNBA by storm, along with established stars and other rookie sensations, Angel Reese, a Canadian from Kingston, Aaliyah Edwards. It's a watershed moment for women's basketball. Our historic season around uh, our attendance, our viewership, this class of rookies, we will be talking about them a generation from now. What about money? Player salaries average $150,000 a year compared with $10 million a year for NBA players. It's a smaller league, but the women want revenue sharing like the NBA. What we're looking for is rev shares. They're making that because of rev shares. Um, and so that's what we're wanting, and that's how we close that gap. And there will be more money because the WNBA is suddenly a hot investment. This franchise will be Canada's team. A group led by Larry Tannenbaum is bringing the WNBA to Toronto in 2026, one of three new franchises. The timing couldn't be better. There are a lot of very wealthy people who are not being shy about spending money. Women's pro hockey is also finding new audiences that didn't exist before. Between hockey's successful launch, soccer's coming next, basketball right on the heels, we're going to have quite a women's professional sport ecosystem in this country. On the WNBA's big stage right now, another Canadian, Chatham, Ontario's Bridget Carlton. She, like Caitlin Clark, are inspiring the next generation. There are so many great players. There's so many great teams. That's why I became a fan of this league, is these people were my idols. I grew up wanting to be like them. Those growing up now should find something new women's basketball taking its place among the major sports leagues in North America. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Friday night. I'm Jeff Semple. Tonight's Your Canada is Banff National Park in Alberta. We love seeing your Canada, so please keep sending your photos to Global National at globalnews.ca. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you back here again tomorrow. Have a great night.